Okie dokie. Alright, thank you everyone. Okie dokie, artichokey. Are we, are we set, you guys? Okay, terrific. All right, the final chapter. Well, it wouldn't be a fitting end if there weren't some fitting stories. Exactly, right? exactly. That's kind of. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader or will you follow? Are you a fighter or will you cower? It's our time to take back the power. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader? Tell her what the president said last night. President Obama called me last night and said, remember, this is no time to be a purist. You gotta keep a fascist out of the way. <laughs> he, he knows me and he knows like I could be, I could tend to err. So but I, would... well, I echo that sentiment. Let's put this in. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's nice that, that, yeah. but that's really yeah. uh, the, the weight of our responsibility yeah. is so it is, it really huge. Is. Yeah. And I don't say this lightly. You can say I don't say this lightly. His agenda is other people's agenda. Hmm. I mm -hmm. I believe if we if you know we're scratching hard, we're trying to figure it out. Interesting, interesting. I mean, well, his agenda is himself. But, but you're but, so he is, but he is to invest somebody else. the vehicle yeah, gotcha. mm -hmm. for yeah. the, the vessel for all yeah. these other people. Mm -hmm. And man of order. And Flynn, mm -hmm. who is a paid uh, tool for mm -hmm. Russian television. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, what yeah. scares wow. me, and I don't mean to make it mm -hmm. even more. <laughs> yeah, if we were already hyped up. <laughs> but, you know, in the last, when I was Secretary of State, starting, mm -hmm. actually starting when I was Senator, but more Secretary of State than since I've been out. The way that Putin has taken over political apparatus mm. or so trying to. Yeah. let them chat for a couple of minutes and we're going to regroup in here and then we'll, we'll, then we'll do a brief with them. Cool. Okay. Hey, you guys, these colors okay next to each other? Yeah. 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 I mean, Okay, I remember asking in late September, should we do like a feature story about October surprises? This is a famous thing that happens in campaigns. And like the consensus was like, no, there's not going to be any October surprises. Like this, this, this campaign's done, you know? And of course it was like one October surprise after the other. October 7th was two days before the second debate. It was a Friday and we were going to be cloistered all day at a hotel near Hillary's home doing debate prep with her. Uh, and then things started to go haywire. This is CNN Breaking News. The United States now openly saying what many inside the government strongly suspected, that Russia is directly behind a series of cyber attacks targeting the upcoming presidential election. The Russians at the highest levels of the Russian government have authorized cyber attacks on political targets and individuals in the U.S. Bombshell, okay? This is, this is a bombshell. And having worked in the White House, I knew how hard it was to get all of that on a piece of paper and have people say, yes, we are willing to make that kind of accusation about Russia. They now have it absolutely cold that Russia is trying to destabilize the American election. We're so excited, like finally, finally, we can have the press pay attention. And so we are on a conference call with our colleagues back in Brooklyn to say, okay, what do we do? You know, who are we gonna put on cable? Someone's gotta write an op-ed. Somebody came over and said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, did she, did she with the Washington Post? Is reporting. Pete, thank you for that. And some breaking news, this coming in just in the last few seconds. NBC News has just become aware of a video capturing Donald Trump making vulgar comments about women. There were TV screens around the room. 
and we all start looking at the Access Hollywood footage, which, and we have no idea what it is. What is he, what is this? A lewd and graphic recording from Donald Trump's past. And raise the volume and like, oh my God. I did try and fuck her. She was married. <laughs> huge news. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even know And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. It was shocking. It was beyond what anybody ever expected to see. And there it was. Somebody said to me, hey, there's this video that just came out of Trump from Access Hollywood. And then I was like, no, stay focused on Russia. But there's no way Russia, the Russia story is holding up to that. Trump has been accused repeatedly of treating women shabbily. Three advisors told us they believe this tape is very damaging and no amount of debate preparation or catchy one-liners can or will take the sting out of it. This is the moment where Donald Trump loses this campaign. People who are like, oh man, it's over, it's done, that's unbelievable, how's he gonna get out of this? But then almost immediately after, as I recall, WikiLeaks dumped John Podesta's emails. WikiLeaks has released a batch of more than 2,000 hacked emails from the account of Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. I get a tap on the shoulder, taken out of the room. Now I'm in a three-ring circus, because I'm trying to pay attention to what was going on. We're following the Access Hollywood unfolding, and I'm trying to fight back on the, on the email release. John Podesta tweeting, I'm not happy about being hacked by the Russians in their quest to throw the election to Donald Trump. The most significant thing in the first dump of emails were the excerpts of her Wall Street speeches, which we'd all, you know, tried to get. They don't just have the transcripts of the Wall Street speeches. What they have is the document that our research director did where we told him, go back, look at the Wall Street speeches, find anything that could be taken out of context to sound bad and make a document out of that. And that is what leaked. <laughs> what leaked is the document that said, present the Wall Street speeches in the worst possible light. That is the document that was leaked, not the actual transcript of the speeches. Honestly, the rest of the day was kind of a blur because all of us were lost in our own heads trying to process what was going on. And we have a debate in 48 hours. Okay. You ready? As ready as I'll be, I guess. That's great. At the time, I was really uncertain about what was going to happen. What, 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 these three events all in one day, and what did that mean for the debate? What did that mean for the campaign? But it, the story seemed substantively the same. So we go to the debate. This stuff with the emails is happening, but, you know, Access Hollywood is still pretty prominent at that point. And somebody rushes in and says, there's a, there's a, some sort of press conference happening. It's not clear what. Well. Like... You ready? You Mr. Trump, does your star power allow you to touch women without their consent? Yes. So uh, thank you very much for coming. And... Going back to the earliest days of his presidency, there were women who had accused Bill Clinton of sexual misbehavior. Donald Trump sort of stirred up a lot of people's misgivings about Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton can't go after Donald Trump for being a sexual predator because of Bill Clinton. Uh, and Donald Trump knows that, and he brings with him, you know, Bill Clinton's accusers to their debate in order to kind of throw her off her game, to shake her. And our coverage officially is underway. There is the Democratic nominee with her husband and daughter, Hillary Clinton, arriving in the VIP entrance now. These women are going to be sitting inside here. He's invited these women who have accused Bill Clinton of sexual abuse, if you will.
Trump, you know, pulled his stunt uh, before the second debate. And all of a sudden, your mind is going crazy. I mean, and, and racing around like, this is incredible. What am I going to do about it? How do I deal with it? But I kept coming back to, from my own experience, the best response was just not getting rattled, not letting him rattle me, not showing that he was getting to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the Republican nominee for President Donald J. Trump and the Democratic nominee for President Hillary Clinton. He has said that the video doesn't represent who he is, but I think it's clear to anyone who heard it that it represents exactly who he is because we've seen this throughout the campaign. You no, know, do you still, you know, answer, answer the question. Why do you, you still believe? You I do. me all the time. What are you Would interrupting? You please? It's called extreme vetting. That was the, the slot that the Obamacare uh, approach was to take. He was stalking me. He was leering over me. He was, you know, sort of preening like a alpha male. I knew he was doing it. I was well aware of it. So I was trying to figure out, what do I do? If I wheeled around and I said, back up, you creep, you're not going to intimidate me, would I sound angry? And would people recoil from that? Because all he's doing is just standing there. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. It is such a great question. I think that would have been a mistake, because then the headline would have been Clinton rattled, right? You know, maybe in this universe, because I do think that we the post-2016 election world is a different universe. Uh, I think a woman could do that and be lauded for standing up to that man that was trying to intimidate her, but not then. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. She's got bad judgment, and this, this is some of his highest numbers. That she should never be president of the United States. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now that we're no longer mites. You survive another night? I'm sorry if you sit there and you it's see me. It's just like a litany of lies. Yeah. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. 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 And he pulls off just the angry guy thing. He looked super creepy. Look, whatever he's got to do, he didn't do. But I think, you know, I think we're going to read. He came in. Come in, Nate. Come in, Nate. All the doors shut. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think if people voted today, she'd be the next president. If people vote tomorrow, she'd be the next president. She didn't do worse than he did last time, which is, I guess, a pretty low bar. But I, I'll be honest, I think this is going to be like a wash. I think it's going to be a lot of like the Sanders Clinton debates where, like, you, you, you. Yeah. During the campaign, we would do focus groups and the fact that she stayed in her marriage would come up as a reason why people didn't like her. Um, or that it proved all she cared about was ambition. It haunts her in a way that she can never get out from under. Please welcome to the stage Hillary Rodham Clinton. After we got through the mess of the impeachment and this very uh, terrible personal anguish. I, I, I didn't know what was going to come next for me. I, I, I just wanted a break. And um, yeah, I was tired. You know, I was tired. It will be but then Daniel Patrick Moynihan announced that he was not going to run for re-election in 2000. And immediately my phone rang. And it was Charlie Rangel, then the congressman from Harlem. And Charlie said, well, you know, the senator's not going to run. A bunch of us were talking. We'd like you to run. I said, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, Charlie. I never saw myself as a candidate. And then it became one of those epiphany moments. 
I'm going around telling all these women to go out there and get in the arena. Maybe I'm afraid to do it. Maybe it's not that I don't want to do it. Maybe it's because I'm afraid to do it. Wow, that was like a whole different level of consideration. One of the reporters said, oh, you don't want to run for Senate. Like, it's too small of a stage. You have the whole world as your stage. And, you know, she talked about how she wanted independence, not from Bill or the marriage, but she wanted to, I think she said, um, you know, I want to be judged on my own merits, and I want to make my own decisions. We talked about it. We already knew we were going to go to New York. She wanted, always wanted to live in New York. I thought it was a good idea. I thought she'd be great at it. I am honored today to announce my candidacy for the United States Senate from New York. Hillary Rodham Clinton made history today, becoming the first first lady ever to run for public office in this country. I was now the principal. I was not the supporter. I was not the surrogate. I was the person whose name would be on the ballot. I care about the same issues you do. I understand them, and I know I can make progress on them. That's why, my friends, I want to be your senator. It was really a challenge saying I instead of we or him. I had to say I. There, she's got the President of the United States, who happens to be her husband. But he, he doesn't be a him. negative as well as right. a positive. That's he sort of cuts both ways. That campaign was tough in reaching women. The questions really were the suburbs of Long Island and Westchester. I would often go to sessions that I used to call Hillary hater sessions, which were literally many women, usually um, women who had a lot of privilege, who had affirmatively said they had either reservations or hated. Hillary and would never vote for her. And then I would say, well, you know, I'm here because I wanted to see if I could answer any questions with you about Hillary. And it would just be like you were watching the exorcist and the bile would come spewing up. I hate her because she's power crazy. I hate her because she stayed with him. Why did she stay with him? Women who judged Hillary for staying with Bill Clinton would have voted for Bill Clinton all over again if they had the chance and kept saying so. I wish I could vote for him again. Like. He cheated on her, like, and yet they took it out on Hillary. And I would say, you know, well, I know many people sometimes have to make hard decisions themselves, but she made one. She loves her husband. I know people find it hard to believe you could love your husband who did something like that to you, but she loves her husband. And at that moment, some woman always in the room would say, almost wistfully and tentatively, my husband cheated on me. And I was devastated, but I, I didn't, I decided to stay with him. And it would open the floodgates. My husband did the same thing. One of my friends did that. My sister's husband did the same thing. And by the end of what in my brain became a little bit like consciousness raising sessions, someone would say, I think I've been unfair. Sixty-two counties, 16 months, and six black pantsuits later, because of you, here we are. When I got elected, the first call I got was from Senator Barbara Mikulski. And she said, OK, I got to come over there and tell you how to be a senator. <laughs> I said, you better get over here quick. I think we're all excited. There was a question, was she going to be a diva? And she did what a good senator does. She went to every committee meeting. She did her homework. She was prepared. You know, from January until September, I was learning the ropes. And then everything changed on September 11th. You saw a yes, plane? Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. The building itself came down. It is a surreal and devastating scene over here, something like I've never seen before. I went that day. It looked like hell. I mean, any 
depiction of Dante's Inferno paled in comparison. It was the most terrible sight I'd ever personally seen. I think about it all the time. The White House had just sent a request to Congress for $20 billion, but not a penny for New York. I mean, we thought there was something wrong. I mean, this couldn't be true. And Chuck Schumer and I, we were invited to meet with the president. And we asked him for $20 billion. And he said, you got it. And for all of my, you know, disagreements with President Bush, I will forever be grateful to him for guaranteeing that we got the money we needed to rebuild New York. She reached across the aisle uh, when she didn't have to. As majority leader, I worked with her co-authoring a bill that was a hardcore Republican and a hardcore Democrat working together. She developed some really unusual friendships with some of her husband's chief tormentors. She works with Newt Gingrich on health care. She and Lindsey Graham and John McCain travel the world on congressional delegations. I mean, there are stories about them doing vodka shots together. I mean, Lindsey Graham, it's amazing to me the way he jumps on her now. You know, it's just, he wrote the tribute to her in Time Magazine. She made one of those lists they do every year. And Time got Lindsey Graham to write the tribute to her. People that know her like her. Her book is a bestseller in eight countries. She has also put her name on more legislation than any other senator in this Congress. Conservatives believe virtually everything she does is aimed at an eventual run for president. By 2008, we were falling deeper and deeper into debt, and I was worried. I was worried about the country. I was worried about its, its trajectory under Bush. And as more and more people started announcing they were going to run, I thought, well, you know, you know, why don't I run, too? I mean, I have as much experience um, that is relevant. I've got as many ideas. Did you think that the country was ready for the first female president? I did not know. Um, there was a lot of evidence that had been compiled that showed people were reluctant about women in executive positions. And president was still seemingly so far off that the answers were totally hypothetical. I am ready for that contest. I always knew that Hillary would run for president after she was a senator. If you didn't, you were letting, letting the movement down. She was someone who was positioned to do it. And that somehow, if you said, listen, I'd rather just tend to my garden, you were letting the movement down. Each of us felt the, the pressure for being the first. I knew that it would be hard. I had no idea how hard it would be. I had no idea, of course, who my opponents would be yet. Generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It was like lightning in a bottle. Barack Obama suddenly became the hot ticket, came across as authentic to a lot of Democrats. Being a politician is a very visceral thing. Greatness of spirit is the most important quality that a president can have. The successful Democrats, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama have all had it. And to have greatness of spirit, you have to be optimistic and you have to be, at least give the appearance of openness. She was never gonna be that. She was always gonna be stiff on the stump and being defensive about being a woman. In my experience, Hillary Clinton kind of always over worried about being a woman. Men won't vote for Hillary Clinton because she reminds them of their nagging wives. The PMS and the mood swings, right? But when she raises her voice, and when a lot of women do, you know, it's, it's, as I say, it's 
it reaches a point yeah. where that okay. every husband you know in what? America has heard it one time or another. A Hillary Clinton nutcracker. <laughs> I insert the nut. When it came to issues of gender and blatant bias, most people didn't see. They could see racial bias in a minute. They could see it in a minute, but they could not see the biases that was happening on gender lines every day in 2008. You bring about change by... You know, when she's out at these rallies and you hear these young men screaming, Hillary, iron my shirts, I guess that's not sexism. I don't know what it is. Uh, if there's anybody still left in the auditorium who wants to learn how to iron his own shirt, I'll talk about that. And you'd be like, whoa. I didn't think we were this archaic, you know. I thought we were a little bit more progressive than this. Let's not forget, and I'll be brutal, the reason she's a U.S. senator, the reason she's a candidate for president, the reason she may be a front runner is her husband messed around. Yeah, but That's how she got to be senator from New York. We keep forgetting it. She didn't win there on her merit. She won because everybody felt, my God, this woman um, stood up under humiliation. The way that the press treated me and the way a lot of the comments that were made about me or to me, I felt that... I was, you know, being appraised and not just like, oh, okay, do we agree with her or not agree with her? But really, a woman. Senator Edwards? Um, I, I admire what Senator Clinton has done for America. Um, I'm sure about that coat. <laughs> <laughs> this notion that there was this woman saying she wants to be the top dog. And that just feels different. For some people, wrong. For some people, it just feels different, so it means you do a different assessment in your head. Is she qualified enough? Is she the right person? Does she have the right personality? Is she doing this for the right reasons? What are her reasons? You know, people would always say to me, I want to vote for a woman, just not that woman. And it was like, well, did 30 years of sexist attacks make her that woman? It is no surprise to me that the first break in the barrier of white male presidents was a black male because he's still what we're used to seeing. Men lead, men are strong, and men champion the issues for this country. You know, people were so swept away by the prospect of the first African-American president that they almost don't see that there is something else historic going on. And not until, oddly enough, when she gives her concession speech, do people suddenly pause and say, oh, wow, that just happened. Now, on a personal note, when I was asked what it means to be a woman running for president, I always gave the same answer, that I was proud to be running as a woman, but I was running because I thought I'd be the best president. But you can be so proud that from now on, it will be unremarkable for a woman to win primary state victories. Unremarkable to have a woman in a close race to be our nominee. Unremarkable to think that a woman can be the president of the United States. And that is truly remarkable, my friends. And although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million cracks in it. Ladies and gentlemen, the President-elect of the United States, Barack H. Obama. When he won, I was really happy and relieved. If I couldn't win, then I wanted somebody who uh, I knew and respected to win. The new president announced some big changes today. He rolled out his team, headed by a former rival, his new secretary of state. I have known Hillary Clinton as a friend, a colleague, a source of counsel, and a tough campaign opponent. Well, I don't exactly know how I went from being his opponent to being his choice for secretary of state. Me deciding to ask Hillary to become my Secretary of State was a no-brainer for me. I think it surprised some people in my campaign. It 
certainly surprised some observers because we had gone through uh, one of the toughest, longest primary fights uh, in modern political history. But throughout that process, I never wavered from my basic view that she was smart, sophisticated about policy, cared deeply about the same issues I cared about. Uh, and keep in mind, I was coming in at a time when I knew I was going to have to devote an enormous amount of time to preventing a Great Depression. From a foreign policy perspective, we were trying to repair relationships around the world. I thought she had the gravitas, the weight, and the credibility in foreign capitals that was going to be hugely important. I think this is a time of such potential and possibility. So I take this office with a real sense of joy and responsibility, commitment and collaboration. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to work. Thank you and God bless you. Once I decided I was gonna do it, I was all in, that's the way I am. And it was an exciting, heady time. She felt that in the competitive landscape of the 21st century, American influence, American leadership was at stake, and that we needed to get to places that had not seen a Secretary of State either ever or in 50 years. When we came into office for maybe the first time in a very, very long time, if ever, China and Russia, their approval ratings on the world stage were sort of on par with ours. I mean, we had dropped precipitously. And so when Hillary showed up, at these places, um, it was a signal to those countries that we care about you, we respect you, you matter. That made it more likely then that we would be able to get their support if we needed to vote in the United Nations or we were trying to resolve a conflict uh, in the region before it got out of hand. No Secretary of State has visited more nations. 401 days on the road, nearly 957,000 miles. From She's Afghanistan to Zambia, we called her the Secretary of Schlepp. I went to 112 countries, which was a lot. This is my sixth visit to Pakistan. There are the pants on fire crises happening right now, the growing crises that are gonna happen soon. And then there are all the other things that left untended will turn into crises. Yeah, with her sunglasses and her Blackberry, she looked like she was the boss. Uh, and people like that. Texts from Hillary is going viral and blowing up across Facebook. It began with a picture of Hillary Clinton focused on her Blackberry with spoofed text messages to movers and shakers. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has been named the most admired woman in Hillary America. Clinton talking she edged the list out Sarah. For the She's the most popular row, woman in America for the tenth year in a row. I remember one day being on the plane with her, and I said, "Oh, congratulations! You're the most admired person again. Only five percent." say that they that they hate you Woohoo! you know this is this great news and she said you realize that's 25 million people <laughs> vladimir putin first developed a kind of sparring ultimately adversarial relationship with hillary clinton when she was still a senator very famously, George W. Bush said of Vladimir Putin, I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul. And Hillary, then Senator Clinton, said, I could have told him he was a KGB agent. By definition, he doesn't have a soul. Which led Putin to turn around and say Hillary Clinton has no brain. And thus, a certain dynamic between them was born. Concerning Russia, uh, you know, we're watching the election results uh, with great interest. When they had parliamentary elections in the fall of 2011, the elections were fraudulent. I mean, they were totally rigged, didn't count ballots, you know, stuffed ballot boxes, the whole deal. And I gave a statement. And Russian voters deserve a full investigation of electoral fraud and manipulation. Tens of thousands of Russian protesters gathering in Moscow, raging against suspected election fraud. Putin turned his anger on the U.S., blaming Hillary Clinton in a cold war of words. She set the tone for some of our personalities inside the country and gave them a signal. He blamed me for uh, inciting the riots, as he called them. 
I watched the two of them interact personally on a couple of different occasions. And while I think there was a streak to Putin that really didn't like Hillary Clinton, a part of him also had a deep grudging respect for her. And I believe that his fear of her winning the presidency was born in part of that grudging respect of having someone who was his match on the other side as compared with someone like Donald Trump, who he felt was anything but his match. This was Hillary Clinton's last day on the job as Secretary of State. I came out of the State Department with such high favorability, and I thought, okay, fine, you know, I have established myself. I believed that I was in as strong a position as I could be to run again. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Why? Because she's untrustable. The Benghazi Libya attacks that claimed the lives of a U.S. ambassador and three other Americans may have happened three years ago, but they could provide some fresh political fodder on Capitol Hill. The American people deserve the truth about what happened, period. Benghazi is a, a very difficult subject for me to speak about because it involved the personal tragedy of someone I knew well, Chris Stevens, who was our ambassador to Libya. Benghazi was a city in eastern Libya in which we had a small diplomatic post. Chris Stevens decided to travel to that post. He didn't have to call Hillary Clinton to do that. He made his own decision to go travel there, as ambassadors do. While he was there, it was attacked by a group of people who were ultimately revealed to be part of a Libyan militia that had Islamist ties. And frankly, without an adequate warning, there was not enough time, given the speed of the attack, for armed military assets to respond. In terms of the aftermath, I was involved in it, and we did our best day by day to give the American people the best information we could. And I was watching Secretary Clinton try to do that, while at the same time trying to help the State Department grieve and heal in the aftermath of this attack. But then some notion, far-fetched notion of a conspiracy here was cooked up, I believe fully cooked up by critics of President Obama and Secretary Clinton, and then pushed relentlessly by Fox News until finally it ran out of steam when the eighth committee to look at this couldn't actually identify anything that had really been done wrong by the secretary. We have no record that you had any conversations with the ambassador after you swore him in and before he died, and you were his boss. I was the boss of ambassadors in 270 countries. She sat and took questions for 11 hours. Congressional hearings are not actually a great way to get information. Uh, they are great theater. And there was a lot of theater that happened. And here's basically what happened to their requests. They were torn up. Well, they that's just not true, Congressman. Oh. They didn't ultimately you know, they didn't get the clips that would make a great attack ad. And in part, that had to have been the goal. In the end, even committee chair Trey Gowdy struggled to explain what had been gained. Mr. And, 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 most important new things you learned today? Uh, I, I don't know that she testified that much differently today than she has the previous time she's testified, so. You know, there was nothing for them to say because there was nothing there. Um, and I thought, okay, great, you know, we're moving on. But here is what I, I want people to understand. Even when something is disproved, people remember that the allegation was made. For people who are only intermittently paying attention in the midst of their very busy lives, oh my God, Hillary Clinton had to go talk to the Congress about, uh, about something she did wrong? And over year after year after year, you know, that kind of constant character assault takes a toll. Even people who are supporters or familiar with you, friends, they brush it off. They don't believe it. But it still has a little 
space in the back of their heads. Um, so then if something else happens, oh, the space gets a little bigger. And uh, that, you know, that's been the story of my public life. minutes away now from the start of the third and final presidential debate. Trump behind in the polls in need of a game-changing moment. Hillary Clinton has a significant advantage in our electoral map. Over 300 electoral votes. We have a 307. Donald Trump in the 170s. Well short of the 270. You need to win, so you think, okay. If Russia and the United States got along well and went after ISIS, that would be good. Look, Putin, well, wait, wait, wait. from everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty clear you won't admit no, you're that the, the Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America, that you encouraged espionage against our people. Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump, I want to thank you both for participating. Hillary Clinton just pushed his buttons, and by the end of the debate, he just unraveled, but he wrote the lead. <laughs> <laughs> Just get it over with. The idea that she took Trump for granted, I mean, there was never a single moment she thought, this is going to be easy. I mean, she thought he was an idiot. She couldn't believe what he was getting away with. But she never thought it was going to be easy. And yeah, we were confident she was going to win. We were confident she was going to win because she kicked his ass in three debates. She opened a huge lead. That's not arrogance. I mean, did you think she was going to win? Yes. Are you arrogant? We were going to Iowa, and we're all on a 737 with the press, and it was 11 days before the election. Things were going so well that we didn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> so I wander back, and I'm just kibitzing, and this guy from the LA Times turns to me, and he says, do you have any comment on uh, the FBI reopening the email investigation, which he said just like that. So, of course, that has to be a joke. I, I, I literally said something like, fuck off. <laughs> We're following breaking news just coming into CNN. Uh, the director of the FBI, James Comey, now informing congressional lawmakers uh, the FBI will review new Hillary Clinton emails. Director Comey drops the bombshell in a letter to Congress, writing, in connection with an unrelated case, the FBI has learned of the existence of emails that appear to be pertinent to the investigation. Back in July, Jim Comey had declared that the email investigation had come to a conclusion, that there will be no charges in this case. We have no basis to conclude she lied to the FBI. And then in October, Jim Comey reopens, in effect, the investigation. As we were landing, I was in a wonderful mood, my best friend from sixth grade, Betsy Ebeling, was with me. I said, I have something to tell you. And she's like, what do you have to tell me? Just like that. <laughs> it's like, it's not good. When it was Jim Comey and emails, I was like, oh, come on. What is this about? Secretary Clinton, have you been in touch with the FBI? Secretary Clinton, any reaction to Director Comey reopening his investigation into your email? So far, no comment from Hillary Clinton or her staff. We didn't know what it was about. We had, I, I, it was so bewildering. I had to get to the event. She goes out on stage, and we're all backstage, talking to lawyers, talking to reporters, just trying to get some intel. The New York Times guy is like, you know, we think it's Anthony Weiner's laptop. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How could Anthony Weiner's laptop have anything to do with this? And then the second stunner. The newly discovered emails were found as part of an ongoing probe involving sexting allegations against former New York Congressman Anthony Weiner. The emails were discovered on Anthony Weiner's laptop. He is Huma Abedin's estranged husband, and she, of course, is Hillary Clinton's longtime aide. When that became clear, you know, Huma burst into tears. By the time we got to the plane, she was Huma was was she was hysterical, like I've never seen her before. It was horrible. She just said, you know, he's going to kill me. He's, you know, he, he, he's just going to kill me. I don't think she mean, meant like Anthony would murder her, but he was going to be the death of her. 
And I mean, Hillary and I were like, it was just wailing. And Hillary was just, she was her friend. You know, she wasn't the candidate, she was just her friend and just calmed her down. And she looks at me and she's like, we're getting ice cream sundaes. I was like, yes, we are. <laughs> we're getting ice cream sundaes on this plane. And we had our campaign manager, Robbie come up to be comic relief because he's amusing. And we've talked about, you know, shoes and clothes and shows on HGTV to keep everybody's mind off of it. But man, that hurt. It is this irony that Hillary Clinton stayed with Bill Clinton after his infidelity and the impeachment. And Huma, who's arguably like a daughter to the Clintons, followed the model and stayed with Anthony Weiner. And then Weiner and his problems end up spilling over and hurting Hillary Clinton's campaign. It's remarkable. Great. Good afternoon. We are 11 days out from perhaps the most important national election of our lifetimes. The director himself has said he doesn't know whether the emails referenced in his letter are significant or not. What would you say to a voter who right now will be seeing you and hearing what you're saying, saying, I didn't trust her before, I don't trust her anymore right now, and they're heading to the ballot box tomorrow? You know, I think people a long time ago made up their minds about uh, the emails. I think that's factored in to uh, what people think, and uh, now they're choosing a president. Hillary Clinton's corruption is on a scale we have never seen before. We must not let her take her criminal scheme into the Oval Office. The last days of the campaign, instead of talking about the Russian interference, instead of talking about Donald Trump grabbing women by the private parts, the conversation is once again about Hillary Clinton's emails. The new email probe comes thousands three months of emails, after emails that appear related to the investigation. According All to you're hearing if you're a voter is emails. And so there was like a conflating of like the WikiLeaks emails and her private emails. Bang. Emails, emails, emails. We saw an immediate drop in my polling. It, it was devastating. I had no reason to believe there was anything there, but I also was in a position where what was I gonna say? And then we had a big, we had a big debate because I was so angry. I was so mad about this. And I said, I'm gonna go out and blast the guy. Oh, everybody was like, no, no, don't do that. You don't wanna get into a fight with the FBI director. I said, he's been fighting me for months. It was one of the, you know, things that I've thought a lot about. You know, maybe I should have. I didn't know how I could win against the FBI director until the whole thing was resolved. And they did not resolve it until the Sunday before the election. Uh, it's sh shocking news. It's uh, from the director of the FBI. The headline is, we're sticking with our original assessment from July, the FBI director says. Not criminal. Nothing new here has changed our conclusion. It turned out those are the same emails they'd already looked at. They're copies, in effect. There was nothing new there. And even though a few days before the election, Comey says, no, nothing to see here, after all, it's too late. Look, I think we still thought we'd win the election because every, literally every poll in the universe, the White House's internal polls, our internal polls, public polls all said we were going to win. We thought, OK, it happened, and we just kept, you know, soldiering on. <laughs> The data said she was going to win, but didn't feel like a winning campaign until the last couple days. That final whirlwind of campaign events really felt exciting. Young women were there, and women were crying, and you just felt like, OK, finally, this is feeling like a historic campaign. I was nervous. But I was, I was hopeful, and I actually was confident. I thought, OK, we've really fought back from all this stuff. Every issue you care about is at stake. 
I regret deeply how angry the tone of the campaign became. Years from today, when your kids and grandkids ask what you did in 2016, when everything was on the line, I want you to be able to say that you did vote. You voted for an inclusive, big-hearted, open-minded country because I do believe we are stronger together. I had covered her on and off for 10 years. I'd never seen her as happy as she looked in that final sprint before Election Day. She and Bill Clinton were, like, cuddling on the plane. dead of night, and I hugged and shook hands and took pictures. Everybody was so ready. And then, like, the next thing you know, we were all at the Javits Center, like, waiting for her and watching the results come in. Oh. Why didn't they film you the night of the election? Why didn't the camera? I, I I don't think we wanted it to be. You know, it was so, I mean, if we'd been winning, they would have. <laughs> I don't think even the staff wanted it. Anyway. We've been building toward this moment now for nearly two years. That's right, Wolf, and there's never been a campaign like this. And there could be new surprises in these final... We were staying in a hotel in the city. Bill is, you know, ensconced in front of the TV. People are walking in and out, sitting with him. I'm walking in and out of my room. I'm really nervous. I'm, like, pacing around, like, oh, my gosh. Um, and the first news was, you know, not what I'd expected. Pennsylvania, Steve. Yeah, this is a state. I think the last time I talked about this, Hillary Clinton had a lead. Seems like a long time ago. Just in the last few seconds, Donald Trump has pulled within 7,000 votes statewide of Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania. Very tense now, Clinton war room right now. They're looking at Michigan. He's 51,000 votes ahead in Wisconsin right now, a state that usually goes Democratic. She was somber. Um sort of, uh, I think, kind of feeling the weight of it. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I at one point said to her, I think we let you down. I went in and laid down on the bed in the bedroom, and I was just, like, bewildered and astonished. And I was thinking, wait a minute, what is happening? I, I, I mean, I've been in lots of elections, and I didn't see this coming. Time went by very quickly, and all of a sudden, it's like 1 in the morning, and we realize there were all these people at Javits. So he's got to tell them to go home. Well, folks, it's been a long night. Several states are too close to call, so we're not going to have anything more to say tonight. But on our way over, AP called Pennsylvania for Trump, and we're like, it, that, and that, you can't come back from that. Pennsylvania's gone. There's no path. You know, the television commentators, the AP and others were calling it for Trump. Uh, and uh, Obama called me, and he said, uh, you know, I'm really sorry. Uh, and he said, but, you know, you probably should concede. I said, I, I'm not going to concede till the morning. I said, I can't. I said, 
He said, well, then you need to call Trump. And I thought, oh, brother. Wow. We drove to the site, and there were people crying on the sidewalks. There were people, you know, holding their children up. I mean, it it was just, you know, like a death. That's the only way to describe it, I guess. <laughs> it's been an honor for me to have this team with you on it. Thank you. I was totally emotionally wrecked. I felt like I'd let everybody down. I felt like, you know, I worried that he wouldn't rise to the occasion, that all the forces he'd unleashed had been rewarded. Uh, it made me sick to my stomach. It didn't make sense. I feel pride and gratitude for this wonderful campaign that we built together. You represent the best of America, and being your candidate has been one of the greatest honors of my life. And to all the women, and especially the young women, who put their faith in this campaign and in me, I want you to know that nothing has made me prouder than to be your champion. Um, it was really, really tough, not crying, not getting a catch in my throat. I mean, it was one of the hardest public moments that I've ever had. And to all the little girls, who are watching this, never doubt that you are valuable and powerful and deserving of every chance and opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve your own dreams. after I got off the stage, after I'd hugged people and held people who were crying and all of the just pent up emotions spilling out, you know, finally, you know, Bill and I left and I just collapsed in the back of the van. <laughs> I was like, what just happened? I lost. I am the one who didn't figure it out. You know, at the end of the day, it was my campaign. I was the candidate. I have to take responsibility. Look, what I said to people after the election, like, when you lose so narrowly, when it's three states and, you know, 60,000 votes, 80,000 votes, anybody who has a theory about why we lost, they're right. Like, fine, <laughs> you know, you didn't talk enough about the economy, okay. You know, it was Comey, okay. It's so few votes that any one of those could have been determinative. There were a lot of lessons that uh, people can and I hope will learn from uh, the campaign. 
But what I loved was the reaction uh, to the loss and the resistance that grew up because of it. The largest demonstration in U.S. history. Millions of protesters around the globe. A powerful message that women's rights are human rights. It began to sprout almost immediately. People decided to engage in the most Hillary Clinton way possible. They're registering voters, they're organizing, they're starting groups. You know, groups that were going to take back the House. A record smashing number of women ran for office this year. We did it! Resulting in historic wins for women in a year that galvanized them. Ready or not, here we come. She inspired a whole generation. I think her legacy is that the Democratic Party is going to be different, that women are not going to stand aside. There's nothing stopping us now. Let's do this. 2020 presidential campaign is turning up to A the record US. six women seeking the Democratic Thank nomination. There certainly was a very big silver lining, and that made me feel somewhat better because, you know, looking back maybe, I don't know, 100 years from now, maybe people will see it as the really historic turning point that lit the fuse. So we just have to keep, keep pushing it forward. I think as long as she has been in public life, there have been these ups and downs. You know, be our champion, go away. <laughs> be our pathbreaker, go away. Change is difficult, and change always comes with steps forward and back, and it's polarizing. And she was different, Hillary was different, and created backlash and excitement in kind of equal measure. I don't know that we're ever ready for the person who has to blaze the trail. We're ready for the people who come after them because somebody else has created enough space for them to not have to shrink to fit. Instead, there's plenty of room now for them to walk in all their glory. And for her, um, she was at the tip of the spear. I mean, this to me is like the full circle of life. And yeah, have there been rough spots and detours and ups and downs and all the rest of it? Yes, but at the end of the day, you know, I've loved and been loved and all the rest is background music. And so I, I have no regrets. I am a very uh, grateful person. <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Okay, Thank okay. Thank you so much. That was great. Parker. Why did they lie? They said to survive. I had to walk along the line. But I don't feel alive. Does that mean I've survived? Does that mean I've survived? Does that mean I've survived?